Hi guys, and welcome to the first video in the Interactive Fog tutorial series. I know people have been waiting for this for a long time, so I'll try and get these parts out as quickly as I can. This is going to be split up into a few different parts because it's a lot to cover in one video. So this first video is just going to be about setting up the project, enabling some plugins and some project settings, as well as the different methods that we can use to write to the fog. We'll talk about those as well as a little bit about volumetric fog and sort of how it works and what it is. Um, and then we'll then move on to creating a basic ground fog material that we can move on to adding the self shadowing, the height controls, and then of course, finally the interaction a little bit further down the line. In terms of project settings, this is obviously just the standard third person template project. Um, you will need to make sure that you have enabled these two plugins, however. So if you go into the plugins and type in volumetrics, uh, if you can spell it helps, uh, volumetrics enabled, make sure that's enabled. And out of habit, I also enable the Niagara Extras. This isn't something that we might actually end up using, but it's always handy just to have a few extra things inside Niagara just in case we need them. Um, you will also need to go into your project settings, search for distance fields, and make sure that generate mesh distance fields is also enabled. You can also compress them, but this has problems with level streaming and all sorts of stuff. We'll just leave this alone for now. Just having mesh distance fields enabled is uh, is important. We'll use this for some interaction and also some height based stuff a little bit further down the line when we uh, talk about the different ways that we can actually do some of the height offsets and all that kind of thing. So uh, once those are all enabled, then we'll come in and we'll start to remove some of this stuff and set up this little scene as well. So I'll give you a second to do that if you're following along. If not, we'll carry on now. Here we just have the standard third person level. So we'll put real time on for now and we'll just go through and remove some of this stuff. So we don't need this. We don't need this. We actually don't want the floor here or these walls. So we'll also get rid of all of these. And um, we can get rid of these two volumes as well for now as uh, we're not gonna be playing with any of this at the moment. And we'll just add a landscape in here. So go to landscape, this will be fine. Just uh, click create. And then we'll just go back to the selection mode grab a few of these and we'll just move them back down to the floor so we can press home or end sorry to do that and that's that the light this is uh this is something that's quite important actually if you're using this scene then by default the atmosphere sunlight will be enabled um this is something that you want to check if well especially if you're using a directional light because this gives you really really easy access to the directional lights direction inside materials without having to pass this in as a parameter into a dynamic material instance or anything that way using the atmosphere sunlight will actually allow us to get the directions of two directional lights if if we need to which is really useful for when we start doing the self shadowing and all that kind of thing there so we of course also need to add a fog volume so if we go into visual effects drag in an exponential height fog and make sure that volumetric fog is of course enabled and that will then allow us to write to it. So in terms of our scene, that's pretty much everything we need to do for now. Um, we will however, just make this light source movable to get rid of these artifacts on the shadowing there. So that is that for now. So we'll talk about what fo the fog is and then we'll talk about the two methods that we can use to write to it now. When talking about rendering volumes in games, there is traditionally two methods to do it. The first is ray marching, which we're not going to discuss too much here. Uh, we will talk about it a little bit as we do the self shadowing on the fog material, but that's something for another video that I have planned much further down the line. Uh, today, all we really care about is voxelization. Now voxelization or a voxel is a volumetric pixel. So you could think of that as a pixel inside a volume texture, for example, or in the case of volumetric fog, now, it actually has a good explanation if you look here under the documentation. This is a low resolution camera frustrum aligned volume textures, basically. So what that means is that inside our camera frustrum or our camera view, we slice this up into a bunch of volumetric squares or volumetric pixels. And we then write a volume texture into each one of these to create the effect of the fog. And it's these volume textures that we actually write to when we're using volume materials. Now, one of the important things to note about this is that because these are low resolution, it does use temporal reprojection, which is using a, a jitter on the voxels position each frame so that we can smooth out these aliasing artifacts, which is similar to how temporal anti-aliasing works as well. Now, this has some drawbacks and 
we'll talk about these a little bit further down the line when we uh, go into doing the material and we talk a little bit about optimization and some of the console variables. But for now, the important thing to understand is that we're right into a series of volume textures and that each one of these volume textures or voxels that our defined fog volume, so let's say we're using this cube to write to it, however many of these voxels this cube overlaps is going to be the cost. It's a linear cost dependent on how many of those overlap times the material instruction count. So obviously if you have a really expensive material and you're writing to let's say 10 voxels, it's going to be more expensive than if you have a cheap material, of course. So that's just something to keep in mind. And that's pretty much all we need to know about the volumetric fog at this point. So we'll go on and we'll look at how to actually write to it now. In terms of writing to volumetric fog, we have two options. We can either use a mesh to write to it, or we can use a particle to write to it. Now these both will use a volume material and we'll create these in a second. We'll first drag in a box or a cube, should I say? And we'll also drag in a sphere so that I can demonstrate something else as well. So let's start by just creating a new folder in here and we'll just call this fog for now. And we'll create a new material as well. We'll call this M underscore fog, just for simplicity's sake at this point. Give that a second to open. Okay, so the first thing you're going to want to do is change the material domain to volume. And then it will also tell you that volume materials must be an additive blend mode. So we'll change the blend mode to additive as well. So you'll notice now that our pins have changed. We have albedo, emissive, extinction, and AO. Albedo is obviously the, the color. The emissive color is also obviously just the emissive color. We can add a little bit of glow to our fog if we want to. And extinction is our density. Now the word extinction might seem a little bit confusing at first, but if you think of this in terms of light scattering, so this is how likely is a photon of light to go extinct as it comes through the volume. And you can think of this as the higher the density of the volume, the more likely that photon is to be scattered away from your eye, therefore technically go extinct, at least from the user's view. So that's the way to think about extinction, really. So this is going to be our density parameter. This is our color parameter, and this is all we're going to worry about for now. Ambient occlusion does come into it. We can actually use this to simulate self-shadowing and all that kind of thing. So we'll look at that a little bit further on. But for now, we'll just add uh, an albedo of white. Generally, fog will have a white albedo if you're talking about uh, particulates of water. And we'll also just add an extinction of one for now. So this will actually end up being really thick, but that's fine. So once you've created that, we'll give that a second to compile. And we'll drag this onto this cube here. Now, as you can see, we now have a nice foggy little cube, which is handy. But if I drag it onto this sphere, we also have a nice foggy little cube, which might be confusing at first, but one thing to note is that when we're overlapping these voxels and we're writing to them, we only care about the bounds of the mesh. This isn't the surface, it's only the bounds. So that limits you to having square volumes when using meshes, usually. But when it comes to particles, this is slightly different. So to write to it using a particle, we will create a new Niagara system. We'll just create an empty system for now. And we'll call this ns underscore fog write. Open this up. System overview, and we'll add an emitter. Now you can enable engine content here. Just add an empty one. Um, and then we can uh, disable this engine content again if you want to. So this is just our empty emitter, which currently isn't doing anything. It's not spawning any particles. It just has the basic initialize state and a sprite renderer. And what we want to do is we want to add a spawn burst instantaneous. And we just want to spawn one particle. And there he is. So under the particle initialization, uh, we can leave the lifetime alone because what we're actually going to do is under particle state, we're going to uncheck kill particles when lifetime ends, which means that this particle now lives forever. And if we go into our emitter state, change it to self and change our loop behavior to once and infinite. Now we will just spawn one particle on spawn and it will live and loop forever, which is exactly what we want. We'll change the size, however, slightly. So if we go into the initialized particle and change the sprite size mode to uniform 
and we'll make this uh, we'll make it a thousand just for now just so it's a little bit bigger and we can uh, we can actually see now if we go into the sprite renderer add our fog material that we just made click compile click save and let this compile for a minute as we drag this in you'll now see that we have a round volume which is the same size as our particle now this is great this is exactly what we want and we can use the material to do some fall offs and all those other sorts of things between uh, between the edge and, and the center and have a nice so we don't have these sharp horrible aliased edges we'll go ahead and look at that in a minute as you can see here though as we move this around this doesn't actually move because we've created this particle once on spawn and just told it to sit there it's not updating its position it's not doing anything so we'll make it update its position as well um, in the particle update we'll just type set set even set new or existing parameter directly and then we'll set particles dot position and automatically it will fill in engine owner position which is the position of our niagara system so we'll just compile that leave that as is and now as we move this around you'll see that it actually follows us now you can see that temporal reprojection taking effect there as this volume moves around and we get that blurring you'll also get that blurring when injecting lights into here so that's something to note as well we will actually have a look at how we can reduce this a little bit later on and possibly even a method for allowing lights into the fog that aren't so uh well laggy is not the word but you know what i'm trying to say so we'll uh we'll we'll look at that at some point as well but for now this is exactly what we wanted so we'll just get rid of these meshes and uh we'll have a look at improving this material slightly now so we have something other than just this Apologies if there was a slight cut there. I just had to get rid of some of these uh, lighting issues that were going on. pre back lighting just didn't seem to want to go away, uh, but I managed to sort that now. So get back into doing this. Um, so as soon as soon as far as our material goes, let's open this up. So I want to improve this a little bit. One of the common things that you'll see when using a particle system is because we have access to our particle data, we want to write a fall off in here from the center to the edge so to do that one of the simplest ways is we could just use a sphere mask to do it so type sphere mask and we'll need our world position so just type position if you type world position in there it doesn't come up <laughs> i don't know why um plug that into a and then we'll take our particle position and plug that into b now for our radius we also have access to our particle radius in here so we'll use that and we'll also add a hardness value now we'll make these parameters because we're going to make an instance of this in a second so we'll call this hardness and we'll set this at one as default even though that's going to be very sharp and we're also going to raise this to a power so that we can adjust the fall off even more so we'll add another parameter and we'll just call this pow for now and set this to one okay so if we now also convert this to a parameter and call this extinction and we then multiply this by the sphere mask we should get a fall off from the center to the edge of our particle now we need to create our material instance so we'll go ahead and do that and then in our particle system we need to make sure that we've set that instance as the material as well okay right if we open up our instance and take a look at these, these parameters so we have our extinction our hardness and our power so we'll first override these two and if we take our hardness down we'll see that we get that fall off now now because density is exponential the fall off isn't quite as noticeable as you'd think but having this down at a value of say 0 0.1 for example will give you a very nice smooth fall off between the center and the edge so we avoid these aliasing artifacts which is nice and then our power value will just by raising this that will also just adjust that slightly so we can get a tiny bit in the center or raise this up more but we'll leave that at one for now i think a hardness of 0 0.1 and a power of one is absolutely fine so as I said, that gives us that nice fall off. So we're going to avoid any harsh edges after that point. So we want to create a, a ground fog effect from this. So the most simple way we can do this without needing access to distance fields or 
anything is, well, currently we, our location is 100. Our landscape is at 100. So that's our floor level as far as we know at this point. So we can, we can use that. So for now, in fact, just in this instance quickly, I'm just going to uh, put the hardness back up to one just so that we've got a harsh fall off at the edge and then we can, uh, we can get rid of this afterwards. So we have the current world position of each voxel. We know this here. So if we take the blue channel of this, this is going to give us our world height. And in a similar way to what we can do here, we can calculate the distance. So if we, well, we can actually use a distance node for this. We can use a subtraction uh, with an absolute value as well. That would work fine, but we might as well use a distance node if it's there. So we'll find the distance of our current particle, our height in the world from uh, 100, which is our current floor value. So we'll take that distance. We'll then divide that by a fall off. So this will be our fall off distance. And we'll say that that is 200 for now. So that will give us a value of zero to one up to 200 and then higher than one above that. So we want to saturate this, which is the same as clamping it between zero and one, but saturate is free. So you should always use this in, in place. If you're clamping between zero and one, you should always saturate. So we now have our value from zero at floor level to one at 200 and then one beyond that. But we want to actually invert this. So we'll take one minus this. So now we have a value of one at our floor level and then a value of zero up at 200. And we'll use this to then multiply against our extinction again. So add another multiply here. Click apply. Allow this to compile for a second. And then we should have some kind of ground to floor fall off here. So we won't have a, a sphere the whole, the whole way. And as you can see, that's worked. So if we go and just adjust a couple of these parameters, we can see what this is doing. So our fall off distance will, of course, the higher we have this, the higher our fog volume will be. The lower we have this, the lower it will be. And we didn't specify a fall off power like we have here. So that's something we'll do now. So we'll set this back to 200 for a second. Go back into the fog, just move this up here. And we'll raise this to a power as well. And we'll call this height power. And set that to one. And plug that into the multiply. Apply and compile again. Give that a second. And then we can adjust this value and uh, see how that changes things too. All right. So if we get a good look here, change our height power. Now, as we adjust this, as we raise this up, it's going to be a lower fall off, as in it's going to fall off slower. As we raise this up, this is a much harsher fall off. So at zero, our cutoff is instantaneous. Higher than this, then it will be a nice smooth fall off. And just give my computer a minute to stop freaking out as we drag these around a little bit lower. Yeah. So you can see that that has the effect that we intended. So this is a way of doing the most basic ground fog possible. If you know that, say, for example, you have a flat floor, or this is in a small area where the floor is, is even, you could even just use the particle position or the system position as your floor position and just have it fall off from here. But we will then go on to look at how we can use the landscape, use distance fields and some scene captures and things like that to add to a, a render target that we'll use as our base height so that we can offset our fog on slopes and over objects and all that kind of stuff. So that will come in the next video because we're going to talk about self-shadowing there and those kinds of improvements which will set us up to then implementing this into an actual blueprint and adding some nice setup to that as well as then adding the interaction and all that kind of thing. So I know this was a little bit short but I hope it was helpful. The next part will be out very very soon hopefully in the next couple of days so keep an eye out for that. If this was helpful like and subscribe, comment Tell me why if it wasn't and tell me if there's anything you want to see and I'll see you very, very soon in the next part of this series. Thank you.